Welcome to another episode of Courageous Me. And I am so excited about this episode because I've got a new friend all the way from Canada, Canada, from Canada. <laughs> and her name is Elizabeth Namoski. And she is a host and producer of Empowered, which is a national weekly Canadian show all about empowering women. And I was lucky enough to be the guest on one of her shows just recently. And we got talking and, oh, my goodness, I needed to have her on this show so that I could get to know who is this incredible woman and some of the amazing things she's done, which, of course, have taken a lot of courage. So on that note, and before we get to know a little bit more about who you are, Liz, could you just share what excites you about having a conversation with me today about courage? Oh my goodness. The fact that you said you needed to have me on, I think that's the most exciting part of, of today. It's been the best part of my day, actually. So thank you. Um, you know, I was giving the end of your day. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it is the end of my day. Yeah. And I know it's the beginning of yours because we're, we're at two different ends of the, the, the world right now. Um, but what excites me, I think the fact that courage is really important. Um, during COVID lockdown, I gave probably about 30 speeches and most were to young women. Uh, women that had, um, you know, just had a new job, women that have been in a job for a long period of time, and a lot of university students. And the interesting part was they didn't have the courage to make a decision. That just kept popping up over and over and over again. And this is why I'm excited to talk about this, because yet again, it has come up. And I think that it seems to be a theme with a lot of younger women and younger women that have just started their, their careers. So I'm super excited to talk to you about courage. Oh, awesome. Awesome. And oh, I so want to go down that path because that really, really, there's so many things to unpack on that. But before we do, can you just tell us a little bit about you and who you are and what you do? And maybe before we get into the conversation off the back of what you've shared, where's somewhere in your life, and I don't care how far back you want to go, where you really recognize that what you did took a lot of courage? Oh my goodness. Like many things in my life. So who am I? Um, Elizabeth Namofsky. I live in Toronto. Macedonian community is very strong here in Toronto. So I would like to do a shout out to the Macedonian community in Australia, especially in Melbourne. So shout out to all, all my, my Massey peeps out there. Um, so I host a weekly uh, national Canadian television show on financial literacy and female empowerment. So anything to help women get past that hump, anything to help women um, get to that next level, uh, whether it's it's um, financial literacy and teaching them about saving and teaching them about looking at bank statements, or you know, I've I've had a woman on the show that was a child bride, and she was in an abusive relationship and had to had the courage to move to that next level of her life to escape and start a new life with her daughters. Um, I, I tackle so many different topics, topics that will resonate with one, two, ten thousands of women um, because we all go through something, but more often than not, we tend to keep it inside because we think that we don't want to share it with anyone. We're ashamed. Maybe nobody else is going through this. Maybe we're the only one. Um, so that that is kind of who I am. I'm also, I work on Bay Street, which is the equivalent on, of Wall Street. It's the financial district in Toronto. And I have, uh, I'm an executive on Bay Street and I've, I've worked in the industry for 27 years as vice president marketing as well. So I mm -hmm. do have that financial background and I do see a lot of people, um, you know, it's, uh, whether I'm at a conference or networking or, or, or giving a speech, uh, people come up to me and talk to me about uh, different financial situations. Um, you know, how do I get out of debt? And, you know, really five dollars, you know, saving five dollars per day. Is that really going to change my life? So that is my background. Oh, decisions oh. of courage. Mm. Or even back. like, were you always 
into like money and finance when you were a little girl growing up? No, or what do you, no. when you were about me. What No, 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 oh, no, no, no. No, it terrified me because um, I think I was raised where, you know, men would focus on the finance and, you know, women would kind of have their own little career on the side, but their main goal was to be a homemaker and take care of their children. Um, my first, it's interesting, my first career was in, in television broadcasting and I worked in broadcasting for 13 years. And I worked on Canada's first daily national business show. Um, you know, I worked on ethnic programming. I, you know, I, I had this wonderful career, but um, there came a, p a point where my show got canceled and I was behind the scenes. I was not in front of the scenes, but that was my vision. That was my goal. That's what I wanted. And I was absolutely terrified to public speak as well when I was when I was little, but I wanted the limelight. I wanted to be on stage and give a speech, but but it scared me. <laughs> so I was Why behind the scenes. On stage? <laughs> what what was it about? I mean, obviously working behind the scenes, what was it about those that were on stage that was so appealing? I think it was the accolades. I think it was people looking at you and thinking, wow. Um now. As, as I grew up, I was in the Macedonian dance group. So we were on stage all the time performing, right? And so that's what gave me a lot of confidence, not to speak, but to perform, right? Wow. Um, then when I moved on to Bay Street working in my executive job, that's when I started getting the courage to publicly speak because our chairman said, well, you know, you're in charge of marketing and you need to introduce whoever's speaking at our seminar. And I was a little bit shell shocked. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to, no, no, I can't do it. I don't know what to say. I'll just do it next time thinking that he would forget. And the next time he said, you said that you were going to um, do the introduction. So you're on. And so oh. I got up there and I thought, oh my goodness, I, 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 you know, he gave me a few words. I said them, I sat down and went, whew, okay, that was okay. And then I just kept doing it more and more and more. And here I am. Oh, wow. And of course, now it's second nature to you to be sitting, talking either on a stage or with cameras on you or what have you. This is a really interesting one because this is one that comes up a lot especially with women and particularly younger, but, but even older as well, that they've got stuff inside that they want to share and they know that they can impact a lot of people. But the thing that's between them and getting this message out there is that fear of either speaking on a stage or in front of a camera or anything like that. What has helped you do that? Because you said you wanted the limelight. You wanted to be at the front and on the stage. But then when it came time to happen, you're like, oh, no, no, no. I'll do it next time. I'll do it next time. Now, luckily, you did have to do it because I think that's part of it. But what do you think or what has helped you do that that others don't necessarily do? You know, I think it works different for everyone. Everyone goes through a different situation. Um, with me, it was repetitive. And then I always wanted to be on camera, like as a little girl, I always wanted to do that. But, you know, it was really interesting because I was told that, well, you, you'll never be on camera. Look at your last name. You're going to have to change your name and you're not blonde or look like Barbie. So you're not going to be on camera because you don't look like a Barbie doll and your last name, you'll never get hired. So I had to get over that first. Um, How did you get over that? How did you get over that? <laughs> I, mean, I think you, it's called age. Try and look like Barbie. <laughs> I think it's called age and accepting who you are and what you look like, right? <laughs> we don't actually all want to look like Barbie anyway, to be honest. <laughs> no, you know, I, I, I think I'm okay. But it was really, it was a rude awakening for me. And I was really young, right? And, and this was what I was told. But when I'd lost my job, I'm, I'm going to digress for a moment. When I lost my job in television, I had a decision to make. Here's that courage question, right? I had the decision to make, do I stay in this industry still or do I make a change in, your, in, in my life? Now, this was when the internet was just starting to bubble up. 
And all of a sudden, new television stations were coming on. So HBO was coming on, the movie network, um, a couple of other stations in Toronto. And we were always used to having, let's say, a handful, five, five different television stations. And all of a sudden, new stations were coming up. And I thought, how are these stations going to make money when you still have the same amount of, of advertisers? So if you have the same amount of advertising corporations, but now you've gone from five stations to 100 or 200, whatever the number was, that to me dilutes the advertising dollars that the five stations were getting. And I honestly couldn't wrap my brain around making money in that industry anymore. So I had a huge decision to make. I thought, what am I going to do? Um, I don't know what to do. Uh, do I go into public relations? What I knew was that um, for journalists to write the Canadian securities course, which licenses you to be an investment advisor, it was half price for journalists. So I asked for the course as part of my severance. And then I thought, oh, wow. okay, okay, well, this could be something for me to fall back on. But remember, I was terrified of finance. I'm not a numbers person. I'm more of a uh, visual person, right? I like to paint. Um, I, I like to create things. So I am more visual than I am at crunching numbers. Um, and I honestly didn't know where I was going to go. But for me, it was courageous to start taking that course, you know, after having a 13 year career and starting in a completely different direction. So if, um, you know, that's probably the answer to, to the, the question that you were asking, but then it keeps going, you know, it's not making that one courageous decision. It is a domino effect of, um, you know, I was asking all of the guests who, who were, um, who were guests on our show, if they were hiring and, and everybody said, no, we're not hiring. No, we're not hiring. But, um, where I work, uh, Tom Caldwell, the chairman said, um, we are not hiring, but I know what it's like to be um, out of a job, alone, at home, sitting in your basement, feeling sorry for yourself. Why don't you come to our uh, office and you can network out of our client rooms? It'll keep you downtown. It'll keep you dressed up and you'll be able to network with people. So, you know, I was, I, I looked, I kind of thought to myself, who does that? Okay, well, this is an opportunity. I'm going to seize it. And so to make a long story short, I did go in six weeks. I um, went to a lot of job interviews. I turned down about five or six different jobs. Um, it just wasn't what I wanted to do. One of them, though, was on air. And I did get this on air gig to fill in for somebody. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. And then the person who hired me got moved to another department. And the new guy said, I have no idea who you are. You're going to have to... Uh, reapply for this position again. And so yet again, I was discouraged uh, because, you know, I just lost my job. They, they canceled the show. Um, but as time went by, uh, our chairman said, you know, uh, we do need a marketing manager. And, you know, we think that you would be great at this job. And I thought, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I will take it and I will learn and here I was going from broadcasting to finance. And for the first year, six months to a year, I was the deer in the headlight walking to the office every day thinking, what have I done with me, like with, with my job, like with my life? I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand the jargon. I don't understand this industry. I just came from broadcasting, <laughs> which is, you know, very, very different meetings than having your Bay Street meetings, right? The financial meetings. So that's another, you know, courageous story as well. And I, oh, think, I love I, it. How old were you when this was happening? I don't want to age myself. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. But this was a long time ago. So I just, I'm just more curious. I feel no. that age doesn't <laughs> give us context. <laughs> you don't want to tell me, but were you like, Little, little, like was that sort of straight out of remember, school? Remember, remember, I was working for 13 years in broadcasting, right? So I'd graduated from school, I had a career yep. for 13 years, and now I've started a brand new career. So I wasn't Beautiful. in my 20s. Yep, yep. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. 
I love that. I love that. And so how did you feel then? You've gone into one thing you didn't like. So you loved more sort of artistic endeavours at school, didn't like numbers, but you're now pursuing a career or did you not was a career or whether it was just a job in financial services? Like how did that sort of play out with how you felt? You know, it's it's interesting. I think if I'm going to be brutally honest, it's it's always been a struggle. You know, it hasn't been easy. I, I work with people who have CFAs. I work with portfolio managers. I work with, uh, you know, investment advisors that are that are you know, constantly you know dealing with with numbers and and buying and selling stock and stuff. Um, do I feel comfortable with it now? Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm licensed as well, so yes, I am. But did I in the beginning? No, I I felt like, as I said, the deer in the headlights, because Mm. it it was just a very different uh, atmosphere for me. However, um, I always looked, my father had his business um, in the First Canadian Place, which is the building next to where I where I work. And that's where all the lawyers and all, you know, everybody who worked in financial services would go and have their suits made made to measure. And I would always go into my father's store and I would, I would do his window, right? I'd go in on the weekend and do his window and, and deal with the bolts of, of material. Um, but I was always look at the men that would come in with awe thinking, wow, they do this incredible thing with numbers, which I do now anyway. Um, but back then I was super, super young and just, it was not even in my purview. Like it wasn't, it wasn't something that I thought that I could ever do or, or even, you know, make a career out of. So it's really funny how as a child, you look at these people and you think, wow, these guys are so smart and they're so, you know, wonderful at what they do. And, you know, you work in that industry now and you're like, yeah, we are wonderful. (laughs) And the, the women are pretty wonderful too. Oh, absolutely. And actually on that note, because it's funny, I interviewed a woman just recently and she was saying that when she was younger, all she wanted to do was to be one of those women that wore a beautiful tailored suit and had high heels and a briefcase. (laughs) And I said, why? She said, I don't know, it just looks so glamorous and all of this. When you said you'd see these men, did you ever at any point think or see women in that space as well and look up to them or admire or have that same level of awe or was it always men? There were women that were going into my dad's store and um, they were, uh, they were management executives. Uh, However, as you know, I mean, you work in financial services. Most of the jobs that women have are, are assistant jobs. Most of them, the majority are not executives. The majority are not portfolio managers. So true. So true. And I mean, this has been, I think, a big thing that has held a lot of women back from the industry is there haven't been enough to date of women in those roles where women are looking up and aspiring, going, yeah, I want to be like that because there's not enough. Do you know what's interesting? I did, when I came straight out of uni, I went into stockbroking. Uh-huh. And very, very, very male. I was in a big firm called Credit Suisse First Boston. Yep. And there was one woman on the management team and she sat in the corner office. And I remember I was just, I had her on a pedestal. I thought she was amazing. And this one day she asked me to come in to see her. I didn't know what about. I was so nervous because I really did um look up to this woman. Anyway, as we got talking, it came out that she had kids and that. And I said, how do you do it? Like, how do you have this really glamorous job and have a family and that? She said, oh, I have nannies who look after my kids. I'm here first thing in the morning before anyone else. I leave late at night. I work all weekends. Oh, don't be fooled. This is what life's like. Yeah. And I remember walking away going, huh, she came off my pedestal firstly, thinking, oh, be careful what you wish for because I don't know. Now, I was only young at the time and having kids wasn't on my radar back then. But I remember thinking, oh, but none of the other men seem to be saying or feeling that. Why are you? So it was the first look in. So how do you, you made a comment 
earlier that you're doing a lot of work and you've noticed particularly say university students and the females finding the courage to make decisions you seem to have made some decisions along the way why aren't they or what do you think's holding them back fear so i did ask uh, fear fear of making the wrong decision so i want to say like i think it's really important to talk about this because Mm. i said like they said well how do you make a decision i said you just do it and they said well what if it's wrong i said so what you 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 accept you, you you take a look at it. You see what's happening, and then you change it. You slightly change it, and and then you make another decision and you move on. And I think the problem is people think that if they make a mistake, it's wrong. But mistakes build you, and they build upon your courage to make those big decisions going forward. It's okay. Like if you need to make a decision, make the decision. I always look at things. I'm not somebody who looks at, um, you know, has a decision and then jumps in and says, yes, I'm going to do this. No, I'm not going to do this. I'm very strategic. If it's a major decision, life, like something that's life-changing, I'm strategic. I weigh things. Should I do this? Should I do that? Which way should I go? I will not, um, make that decision right away. I mean, if it's, you know, buying something, I know I can afford it. Yeah, I, I'll, I, I make that decision on the spot. I don't, I don't care. But if it's something that's life-changing, you really need to sit, look at it and weigh your options. What happens if I make this decision? What happens if I don't? Um, the problem is a lot of the women that I was speaking with were saying that, you know, they're just afraid to make the decision. And I said, you know, just Nike it, just do it. Just go ahead and make the decision. And if it's wrong, okay, you stand back and you look at the decision and you think, well, which way do I go now? Do I stick with what my original decision was? Do I tweak it slightly? Or do I abandon it completely and and make a completely different decision? And I think the key is we need to learn from our decisions, right or wrong. We need to learn more from our wrong decisions. Why was it wrong? How has it changed my life? How will it make me go forward with my with my future decisions? Because the deal is, with all the wrong decisions that we make, they and those are failures. But we need to look at the failures so that they build upon our foundation of success. So a failure doesn't just mean, oh my God, I'm a failure. No, look at it. How do you learn from it? What have you learned from it? And what what is your next decision going forward? And I think one of the other key things is that a lot of people don't do and they're afraid to do is ask questions. My mother always said, if you don't ask, you don't know. And that's one of the key things. Like I, I'll, I'll be talking to people and I say, well, did you ask so-and-so? No. Why not? Well, I don't know. I just didn't. So ask. Who cares? Who cares if it's a right or wrong question? You'll know what the answer is. Ask so why don't we do that? Yeah, Sorry? why don't why why do women particularly get so concerned about even asking questions? What do you reckon that comes down to? I think it has it a lot of it has has it comes down to confidence. Um, hmm. oh my gosh, what if it's wrong? What will people think about me? Like, who cares? I'm, I'm, I'm so past that. I really don't <laughs> care. You know, if I make a wrong decision, I will go ahead and, and, you know, take a look at it, assess it and go, okay, that was wrong. Let's go this way. Um, Asking questions too is really important. I have a really cool story that I can share about courage. Please, um, please. I have a cousin of mine who um, was living is living in Belgium, and she, you know, at the time she was living there, um, not as a Belgian citizen, let's say, and so she was cleaning homes, making money, and living in a shared home. And when she would go to work to make, you know, $10, 10 euros uh, a day or whatever it was that she was making, 
uh, the household would go into her room and steal from her, you know, wherever she would hide her money throughout clothing and stuff. And they would steal from her and steal whatever euros she had saved for herself and for her son. And we were on Skype and she was telling me about this and I got angry. And mm -hmm. so she shared it with me. She told me about it. It was bothering her. She was embarrassed that this is her situation. And I said, no, we need to fix this. And so I said, you know what? I'm coming over there. I'm going to book a flight. I'm going to rent a hotel room. You and I are going to share a room for a week. And I am going to come there and I'm going to open up a bank account for you. And here I am, right? Okay. First of all, I don't live there. Second of all, I understand money laundering rules. I understand, you know, red flags and everything that we're not supposed to be doing. But, um, you know, I spoke to uh, uh, compliance at work. I spoke to their chairman at work. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do because I want to go and I, I want to help her. And they went, okay, book my flight, go over there. I, I'm, here I am. I'm, I'm in, in Belgium. And as you know, um, some speak English, some speak Flemish, and some speak French. And so I'm with my cousin and we walk around. I go to see the bank manager. I have to make an appointment. I'm like, okay, I've got a time constraint here. Uh, so I make an appointment and my cousin and I go and we have this meeting with the bank manager. I have no idea which bank it was. I have no idea. Like this was a long time ago. So I, I can't remember a lot of these things. However, we're sitting in the bank manager's office. And so I'm sitting here, my cousin's sitting to the right, bank manager sitting in front of me. And so the bank manager and I are speaking in English. My cousin and I are speaking in Macedonian and they're speaking in Flemish. So it's, it's, it's a really weird, weird, you know, um, situation to be in. And as I say to her, I said, okay, this is why I'm here. I'm Canadian. I work in financial services. I would like to open up a bank account for my cousin. And she had a Serbian passport, which is Cyrillic, which means nothing to any other English speaking country, right? <laughs> so Cyrillic passport doesn't help you anywhere really. Um, at that particular time, maybe it does now. I don't want to, I'm not dissing Cyrillic passports. Um, but in this particular instance, it was not helpful. And so I said, you know, I understand what's happening here, but I flew all the way here to help her because she reached out to me for help. Right. She was courageous of her to, to reach out and speak with me. So I said, you know, I understand this does not sound like a really good situation. We'll just open up the bank account in my name. Like, I'd like to do it joint. They said no. So I said, okay, in my name, we're going to put minimum amount of money in the bank account. No money going in, no money coming out. And just a safety deposit box to put whatever, you know, little pieces of jewelry she has. Put it in there for her just as a safety thing. And, you know, the questions kept coming up to me. Are you buying, are you going to be buying uh, property in Belgium? No. Are you going to be working in Belgium? No. And I said, I know this, this doesn't look good. Just, <laughs> this, this just doesn't bode well for me right now. However, <laughs> I, I really, I'm, I'm asking you for some help because I, I came here to, to help my cousin. And the bank manager looked at me. And there was silence. And I thought, uh oh, we're going to get kicked out of here and nothing's going to happen. And she said, as women, we need to help each other. I'm going to open up that bank account for you, but only you will have access to it. And I said, no problem. And so we opened up that bank account and you know, I, you know, it was in my name. So everything, you know, uh, all the documentation would come to my house. But, you know, my cousin did become a citizen and the bank account is in her name now, you know, and so that's, that's courage, courage to um, go and live somewhere where you have no family or don't know anybody and you are leaving a situation which is not good for you. 
um, courage to push and push, ask for help and, you know, courage to move on and, you know, make it right. Oh, wow. I love that on so many fronts. And even the courage for you to do what you did. You didn't just try and do this behind the scenes. You got on a plane and went over to Belgium to do this yeah. for her. And now, you know, it's all panned out. And I love that the bank manager, the bank manager, of course, or the, the banker was female, right? Yes. So they didn't necessarily have to do that. But I yeah. love that they did. Like what a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's funny because even just that one story gives me the sense of why you're doing the work you do to help women because this is just something in you. That is just glorious. Yeah, you know, in, in hindsight, you know, what was I thinking? Like, really? I, I was just, yeah. I was angry and I wanted to help her. And I was like, fine, this will be my vacation. I'm going to get on a flight and I'm going to do this. And I, I I decided that I was going to make it happen. And and you're right. It, it did take courage to, you know, <laughs> walk into that office <laughs> and just say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a citizen. I'm, I'm not buying, I'm not buying property. And, and this is, this is the, the honest story. I'm, I'm going to be honest and, and truthful here. And, and the bottom line is I was very fortunate. It was a female bank manager because I don't know what it would have been like if, if it was a male bank manager. And I was very fortunate that she saw the big picture and said, you know, as women, we need to stick together. And, and I think that is also a really incredible story because I've heard way too many stories of women not helping other women, women putting down other women. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't play that game. And that doesn't, you know, sit well with me either. Um, I have no problem uh, reaching out to somebody on LinkedIn that I don't know, or, or calling somebody that I don't know and say, you know, I, I just need 20 minutes of your time. I need to pick your brain. This is my scenario. I, I really like to know, you know what you think about that. And I think the problem with younger women is they don't have the courage to do that. And I think we need to get them to that level and they need to have that courage. They need to be bigger and better than, than, than you and me, Kim. Um, mm. because you know, you and I are going to be stepping down at some point and we need this next generation to be just as curious and, and, um, you know, ask the questions whether they're right or wrong, who cares? And, you know, if you are, if you are put in a situation where you're not happy with, with the outcome, you know, you need the courage to go ahead and make a change. That is so true. If you're not happy with how things are panning out, and I see a lot of younger women go, oh, but this, but that's like, no, 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 no. You're not going to change the bigger picture. And if you've got yeah. some people that are being toxic and treating you the wrong way, and you're not going to change an organisation, but you do need to do something, you need to take some action yourself. And, yet yeah, that whole fear. So on that, and you were talking about how failure is not a failure, it's a foundation for success as long as there's learnings that are attached to it. Mm -hmm. Where in your life, and again, I don't care how far back you want to go or how recent, where have you made a decision that became a learning as opposed to, yeah, that was the right decision? Oh, my goodness. Um, I'll, you know what? It, 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 there's so many, and honestly, I can't even get to specifics. It could be relationships with with men that I was dating. Um, different so one easy one. No. Tell <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, me one where you you said no, even though maybe your heart or your head was saying, "But this guy's perfect for you," and you went no. Okay, you what must I have can do up. is I can tell you um, the change that I had to make with my husband. Okay, uh, great. Because when I met him, I, you know, I was of the mindset that I didn't want to get married and I didn't want to be in a relationship, but I had to become vulnerable in order to make that relationship work. And nobody wants to be vulnerable, right? Um, and 
I had to do that. So I can tell you a positive story about that. I don't want to dwell on the negatives that I've been through. Um, but in order to make that relationship work, in order for our trust to grow, I had to be super vulnerable, which I'd never been before. What, okay, so was there a moment where that actually came out? Like, did you have to share how you were feeling or what was a moment where that vulnerability came out where it was almost like you needed to do this in order for the relationship to progress and you did it, it was uncomfortable and and I'm assuming you're still happily married, so it, it oh, did yeah. work oh, out. Yeah. I think he's in yeah, the like, other room listening to this too. whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, um, perfect. <laughs> you know what? No, I, it, I just knew, you know, I just knew that at the time that if I wanted to make this work, I had to, um, okay, I had to bring my walls down. You and I have a mutual friend. And she had said to me one day, you know, I've known you for, I've known, I've known her for almost 30 years now. And she said, I've known you for such a long time. And I feel like I don't know you because you have all these walls built around you. And, you know, you, you know, every time somebody gets close to you, there's another wall that they have to get through. And so that, that resonated with me. Right. So I needed the courage to bring down those walls and become vulnerable. And how do you do that? Like knowing you need to do that, and especially if you've been called out on it, is one thing. Doing it is another. Yeah. So well, when you've had, what do you do? I, what have you done? You know, Kim, I I don't know. Um, yeah. When I get called out on something, I think about it, and when it resonates with me, I I think about it a lot. Um, and and when your friends call you out, it's for a reason right? It's, it's because you're close. They love you. Um, they want the best for you. And, you know, it, it's all character building, right? It's, it's part of building your character, building who you are, getting to that next level. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's being courageous with who you are, right? Accepting mm -hmm. who you are and dealing with your, your faults and, and your positives as well, because, you know, we're not perfect. There's no such thing as perfection because that's just a moving target. Mm. But again, perfection is something that really holds so many women back. And I, I've, I've had that curse for so, so, so long. And if, you know, we're being honest here, right? It's you and I, yeah. I've also had girlfriends call me out on yeah. because I ask a lot of questions. I've had it turned back and gone, well, do you ask a lot of questions to avoid talking about yourself? And you know what? Like, and that, that makes sense, though. It totally makes sense because I ask a lot of questions as well. <laughs> so, do you know what it is? Like, I'm, I'm a classic introvert, and I know it's all about energy and all of that, but I'm a classic introvert, and I found that to get through networking events or to go to places, and when I was young in financial services, the one thing that kind of became my fallback when I felt uncomfortable was to ask questions. Yeah. And so I then became very good at it. But what I find too, Liz, is sometimes because you ask so many questions, nobody even turns around and asks things back. So it's not even like I'm withholding information. I just don't get asked it. However, when I have been asked it and I've got uncomfortable, it's like, ah, okay, warning, warning, right. you're feeling uncomfortable. You need to now embrace this. And that's where <laughs> vulnerability has played out for me that, yeah. So I'm interested that it sounds like you've been called out as yeah. well. I think and you and I are very similar, Kim. I think, um, you know, just, just talking to each other through, you know, emails or, you know, when you were on the show and, and, and in here, um, there's a similarity and, and maybe it is, uh, I'd like to call it wisdom through years of of working in in the industry. Um, I'd like to call it, you know, being surrounded by incredible friends who will call you out when um, when they think that you know you're a little bit off or whatever. Um, but I think that is it, it, it's going to circle back to what I said earlier about asking questions. 
Um, we need to ask questions. We need to be curious. And I think that is something that isn't happening a lot right now. I completely agree. Do you remember a moment back, say, when you were young and you said your mum sort of encouraged you to ask a question because if you don't ask, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you remember sort of that playing out when you're a little girl where that advice from her actually, you know, had an impact or, I don't know, maybe you hadn't been speaking up in class, for example, and then suddenly you had that, your mum in the back of your mind and you did something, do you know? Can you remember a time when that played out? I always ask questions though. That was something that my mom ingrained in me. Um, mm. So I, you know, I, I always put my hand up. I always wanted to answer the question and stuff. So um, okay. I don't know. Like, I, I don't that know. What about you? Like, when did you start asking questions? Oh, so it's interesting, right? So I have got a very, very loud voice. Yeah, so do and, I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. And I remember my mum said to me not that long ago, because as mum is getting older, her biggest fear is about becoming invisible, and that that just petrifies her. And she said to, and she's got a, she's quite softly spoken compared to me, anyway. And she said to me one time not that long ago, "Oh, you're really lucky though. You're always heard because your voice is loud." And it's so funny because I sat back and thought. I do have a loud voice, but for a lot of my life, I never used it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's loud or not from a volume point of view, you don't use it. If you don't actually out there saying, I didn't, I held back for a long time saying what I thought or giving my opinion or, or I would only put my hand up and answer something if I 100% knew the answer, not to ask a question. Right. And yeah, so I had to learn, so I had to learn through, asking questions and like I said it became my fallback to get out of or to get around networking events and everything so it wasn't an innate thing I learned it it sounds like for you you kind of grew up and asking questions is like your superpower yeah I you know what I think I think I did and and you're right you know I keep telling younger women as well you have a voice use it it doesn't mean to yell it means no. to you know you need to be heard Ask the questions, not just sit, you know, behind, sit at the boardroom table. Don't sit behind, uh, put your hand up, ask the questions um, and share, share with friends. Don't be ashamed to share with friends. I mean, um, you know, I did a show on romance scams. And when you are in that situation where you're being scammed um, and you think that you are with the love of your life, Basically, what they do is they start pulling you away from your friends and family and isolating you from everybody, right? So that you don't have a voice. So don't lose that voice. And, and if you think that you are in a, in a romance scam type of situation, share it with a friend. And if you've been through that, share it with a friend because you'll protect them from going through it as well. And don't you think as a woman that when you share, really share, like the real stuff with someone else, even if only one other person, how much better it feels. I know. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. It's and do you know, as a bottle of wine, though. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Always, always better with wine. <laughs> do you know, I was at a dinner last night and it was with six women and each of us only knew one other person. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful that we were, we actually got onto the topic of menopause, which a couple of the girls were a little bit younger. And what we we're all talking about was like, oh my God, even just sharing that we've all got an example of where this has played out in our lives. We've all shared, and every one of us had thought that there was something wrong with us, only to realize that, huh, you've got it, you've got it, you've got it, you've got it, you've got it. There was that normalizing of, our own experience that was so refreshing and all of us kind of it relaxed the vibe and oh we got deep and juicy after that it was just beautiful I think this is such a superpower that women have not all women but some but some so you know what all the yeah, I just mm. wanted to add Kim you know yeah. that what you just said is really important especially when you mentioned networking earlier as well um you know 
men go and network because it's part of their job. Women go and network because they think, oh, I think I have to go. Maybe I'll, I'll um, I don't feel like going. I'm not going to go tonight. I mean, I'll go to the next networking thing. We really need to do it. And, and we need the courage to go and talk to people. Um, you know, we were, <laughs> so I'm going to contradict myself here because as children, we were told not to talk to, to, to strangers. Um, it, in a work environment, networking, go talk to strangers. When it comes to scammers and fraudsters, do not talk to strangers. So remember those three, right? Do not talk to strangers <laughs> as children or to scammers. Anybody who's calling you or emailing you. However, for networking, go talk to strangers because it really boosts your confidence. It allows you to get a voice and it allows you to um, hone in on your way of speaking to people and your way of being heard. Oh, isn't that the key though? It's your way. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of women as well that think, oh, but but they do it this way, so I've got to do it that way, but I'm not like them. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no. Your way as you, that's where that the real beauty is, isn't it? Just that uniqueness. And you know, even when you come up with ideas and you think, oh, yeah, but but it's already been done before or someone's already said it before or someone's already asked that question before. It's like, yeah, but not through your lens they haven't. No one else has done what you've done or said what you've said or brought what you want to bring to the table the way you do it because no one's lived life exactly the same way as you. So there's some there's some things that I think over time we can get better at, but you've got to practice it right. This is yeah. not this is not intuitive for a lot of people. So what's when you go into a, a, a room, say, with people where you don't know anyone? So I've invited you to a big gala dinner. I'm off doing something, right? So you, you, I'm not your fallback. You can't come and talk to me. Mm -hmm. What do you do? How do you kind of approach that? Because one, you know, your confidence is just so beautiful. What do you do that others could maybe learn from? Uh, you know, okay, so if we're at a gala, there's a silent auction, right? So you walk around, take a look at the silent auction and and start talking to somebody. What do you think about that? Are you interested in that one? I really am. Or like, it's easy to strike up a conversation. Uh, I was at a book launch um, in February and I didn't know anyone. It was uh, an entirely different group a financial services people or media people. So it, I didn't know anyone. So what I decided to do was I went to the bar, I got myself a glass of bubbly and I stood in the center of the room towards the back. And I thought, well, everybody's entering from the front. I'm going to stand in the center and see what happens. And so I stood there <laughs> <laughs> and this, this man came up and started talking to me and I started talking to him and um, you know, we had a really good conversation. Then his friend came. So then we had a conversation and then they left and I thought, okay, I'll go to the bar again. So I went back to the bar and I came back and the man was standing, a new man was standing in my spot. And so I tapped him on the shoulder and he looked at me and he was like six, five. And I said, excuse me, you're standing in my spot. And he, and he said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I said, um, this was my chosen spot. I went to go get a drink and you're standing in my spot. And he went, okay. <laughs> so I said, can I have my spot back? So he moved over and I said, no, no, you need to keep moving over. This is still not my spot. And so I stood in my spot and I started laughing and it, it just so happened that, um, he, he works in this industry and I have a friend that worked in that industry and they knew each other. And uh, I said, oh, you know so-and-so? And he said, yes. And I said, here, let's take a shot. Of, let's take a selfie and I'll text it to him. And so then I started laughing and I said, great. My husband's going to look at my phone and say, who's this guy <laughs> that you just had your selfie taken with? But it was, um, <laughs> you just- Oh, glorious. 
you just, you know, you just make the best of every situation. And I, I have a little bit of a crazy sense of humor. So I, you know, I decided to create my own spot. And when somebody was standing in it, I had to make them move. I've actually got tears from laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is absolutely beautiful. I don't know if you've ever come across the woman, Vanessa Van Edwards. No. So she's, she's an American. She's got a business called Papal School and she calls herself um, a recovering woman with social anxiety or something like that. I've, I've got that all wrong, but she does a lot of work on people skills and she talks about what you do when you go into a networking event. Mm -hmm. And one of them is go and get a drink. And it's not even for the alcohol, it's for the experience of being at the bar and you talk to the person next to you. Oh, yeah, so good. And then she talks about strategically placing yourself in the room. So as soon as you've said you've gone middle at the back, so everyone else is coming forward, it's like, I wonder if she's read the book. What no. I've not heard is when you've gone back to the bar, <laughs> come back and someone's in your spot and calling them out on it. Like, that and of course you struck up a conversation. You got to know them, and it's fun. You should have seen his face because he didn't know what to do with me. He was like, I "I'm sorry, what? You're on my spot." <laughs> I just think that's gorgeous. And what I love is how easy was that to do? Oh, simple. It was just you know I I was by myself, and I as I said I I didn't know anyone in the room. Uh, afterwards, I had a, a female friend arrive and, and I hung out with her for a little bit. But for the very beginning, I didn't know anyone. Um, and so, yeah, I, I made that I made that spot my own and I claimed it. <laughs> I'm so going to do a social experiment <laughs> and go and do the same thing. And I will report back to you. Yeah, please. <laughs> I'll actually get a selfie. And anyone else listening? Why don't we all make this a challenge, right, <laughs> to do exactly what Liz did, get a selfie, and then they can either send the selfie to me or send it to you. I reckon that would be a cool social experiment. And particularly because for some, like it sounds like for you, you're very comfortable to do that. I'd be very comfortable to do that. For some, it will take courage. But one thing I've learned with courage is when you take courage in one area, it almost like it's contagious and then it comes up in another. So that might be one moment you've got to really reach in, but then the next time you go to a networking event, it's a little bit easier or you have your own little tactic. Ooh, but you know what? Why not? Who cares? Like, why not? And and with that selfie, as I said, I sent it to my friend. It was just pure serendipity. Um, and so I connected them because they hadn't talked to each other in years and then, you know, my, my friend texted back and said, oh, ask him about Barcelona and the light bulb. And I was like, OK, so I then I said this to the stranger and he started laughing and he said, oh, my goodness, I forgot about that. But it, it was just very funny. It was a weird and, and wonderful situation. But, yeah, I was standing there by myself without any friends or, or not. You know, I didn't know anyone, but I made it. I just decided to plant myself and own my spot. And, and, you know, mm. if anybody says, well, I can't do that. My question is why not? Why not? Why can't you do that? And what would be the number one reason that really is underlying all of that? Fear. Mm -hmm. Courage, mm. right? You need courage to get past the yep. fear. Absolutely. And do you know what I find too, when you dig deeper on the fear, it often comes back to the fear of what other people think of you. Yeah. And it's like, but, like, we're listening to you tell this story. What are we all thinking of you now? We're thinking you're amazing. Like, <laughs> high five. Thank you. <laughs> high five. That's the worst thing that's going to come out of this. It, and, you know, one thing to another thing I, I often talk about, you know, we're all so concerned about what other people might think. Everyone's so consumed with thinking about themselves. They don't have time to think about you. And, and look look at that woman standing in the middle of the room. She looks really strange. Okay, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about what people think. How many years have we heard about, you know, what will the Joneses think, right? Your next door neighbors. And it's been proven that, you know, if your next door neighbor wins a lottery, they start buying stuff. The whole neighborhood starts buying stuff and the whole neighborhood will go bankrupt because they're trying to keep up with the Joneses. It's that whole thing. What will your neighbors think, right? Who cares? Live for yourself. 
So you do that beautifully. Have you always been like that? Uh, maybe my Balkan roots have helped me do that. Um, I, I, when I was younger, I was insecure. Of course I was insecure. I think every woman is, but, um, you know, I struggle. I think we all struggle with the imposter syndrome, no matter how successful you are, no matter how, um, you know, uh, where you are in your career, no matter, you know, what friends you've got. Um, I, I think we all, we all struggle. Yeah. I mean, do I, am I confident? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Do I have days that I struggle? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do. And when you have those days, what gets you through it? Like, what do you find helps you on the day you're struggling or the day you're feeling a little bit insecure or that little imposter monster is raising its ugly little head? What do you do to work through that or to get through that? And it might be subconscious now that you're even doing it, but what 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 works for you? I'm, I'll have a conversation with my husband and, and oh. he'll say, you know, yeah, I, I talked to him about it and he's like, why? You know, <laughs> Uh, you shouldn't look at what you've done, whatever. And we have a conversation and then I just move on as, as usual. But we, we talk about it. Absolutely. What if he's not available to talk? What would you do? What's sorry, your plan I, B? I missed that. I missed the question. Sorry. Uh, what if he wasn't available to talk? My girlfriends. What would be your my plan B? I talk to my girlfriends girlfriend, as well. Yeah. I surround myself with incredible women. I, I, and, and, and so here's another thing too. I surround myself with incredible women, which means I know that I will never fail because if there is something that I do not know, I will ask one of them the question, Kim, if there was something that I was struggling with, I would pick up the phone, I would text you, I would call you, I would email you and say, Kim, I know this is your area of expertise. I'm struggling. What should I do or how should I do this? So this is my situation. I am a firm believer that if you are struggling with something and you don't know how to get to that next level, again, ask the question, go to the person that you know has that expertise, surround yourself with some pretty incredible people to give you the courage to get to that next level. Yeah, that's gold, isn't it? Completely, completely, completely agree. And one thing that came out even at this dinner last night was how when I was asking questions, some people were a bit like, oh, I feel like I'm being a bit arrogant if I say this. I'm like, okay, pretend you're telling me about your best mate. Bang. They're just like. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, so having, it's so interesting, isn't it? But, yeah, having that circle is gold and being vulnerable in that circle yep. and being able to share <clears> and ask. <throat> And not have to have all the answers all the time. But, you know, we need we need that. We need to be able to share because, I mean, if you don't share, all that negativity in your head takes up a lot of space and it grows and it gets uglier. So you need to talk about it. You need to share and get that out of your system or all you're doing is debilitating yourself. And, and you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, sounding arrogant. Well, if a man was to say it, he sounds confident. If a totally. woman was to say it, well, you know, there's all these other excuses to bring her down. Mm. We're, we're, we need like our confidence. We need to get to that next level. We need the courage to keep growing. Completely agree. So on that note, uh -huh. what is the next thing in your life, in any area of it, where you need to reach in and find some courage? Huh. I don't know. Um, I, I do have a plan for myself. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with my painting. Uh, I paint and, um, you know, when, when you come to Toronto, um, you'll see my paintings are all over, all over the home. You can see a little bit of my painting in there. Um, but, oh, you know, the courage to, you know, this is one of my paintings as well. Um, oh, looking oh, at, the yes, I'm looking at marketing my, my paintings. I've made scarves as well. So I think that is my next courageous 
thing to, um, you know, get my paintings on products on, let's say, a larger scale. And get them out into the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, as soon as you do, <laughs> let me know and us Aussies over here or anyone listening in, we will be, we will <laughs> buy your stuff. <laughs> Thank because you. I think when you hear the story behind it and you can relate to that story, like, oh, fruit makes it so much more, <laughs> I don't know, so much more connected to it. So, and just, just tell me on this note, what sort of painting, like is it, I mean, I saw the cup, but is it landscapes or abstract or? Uh, a lot of abstract. It's acrylic, a lot of abstract. Um, I may do flowers, like I'll do lavenders, poppies I've done a lot of. Uh, I've, yeah. I've put them on T-shirts. I've done scarves. Um, but I need that, I need that courage to take it to the next level and, and see how I can, you know, you know, get, get this mug on, on your desk. <laughs> oh, I agree. I need that mug on my desk <laughs> and so do so many other humans. If nothing else, for the fact that it's a really pretty mug. Thank but you. But secondly, because that, that represents courage and actually the way that Courageous Me, which has become a lot of the work I'm doing now, came about was because I was at the shop buying some coffee mugs to give as gifts to women that were doing some research that I was conducting. There were four words. There was courageous, wild, fierce, and strong. And I said to the woman at the front desk, which of these four words resonates with you the most? And instantly, she was about in her late 50s, instantly she said, oh, courageous. And when I asked why, she said, well, doesn't every woman need a bit more courage? Yeah. And I went home that night and the next day, came up with the name Courageous Me and started my podcast the next day called Courageous Me. Amazing. All off the back of a coffee mug. Amazing. So how many lives could be changed from you getting those coffee mugs out into the world with your artwork on it? And your artwork, going back to the beginning of our conversation where you said you grew up artistic and loving art and, and painting. So, yeah. oh, Liz. Absolutely. I seriously could sit here and talk to you all day <laughs> or all night for you. Thank you so, so much for sharing the beautiful, the wisdom, the stories, and really encouraging women of all stages and ages to just, you know, to get in there, find that courage and just go and do it because life is just so much more beautiful when you do it. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you so much, Kim. It was such a pleasure and I can't wait to meet you in person and hug you. <laughs> oh, same, same. Either in Toronto or in Melbourne. Yes. We'll do one of the two. We'll yes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Cheers.